Okay, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk this morning about uh, some research I've been kicking around for the last couple years, um, thinking about uh, how difficult it is to kill systems. So uh, there's a lot of people have looked at uh, Bitcoin and other uh, modern consensus protocols or Nakamoto-based consensus protocols from the point of view of, uh, is it uh, possible for miners to deviate from normal behavior to maybe make a little bit more money? Um, and there have been arguments about whether or not this is possible in certain cases. But uh, this, this talk will be a little bit different. It will be assuming uh, we don't necessarily have a financially motivated attacker, so not uh, a miner who's just trying to make a few extra Bitcoin, but we have a large, potentially well-funded party uh, whose goal it is to just cause disruption, maybe to even try to kill your system permanently. So this uh, idea is, is pretty old, well, at least five years old, and it was named uh, a Goldfinger attacker in a 2013 paper, so uh, named directly after a James Bond villain. Um, so there's a lot of potential ways that you could do this. If you start with uh, you know, a really open slate to, to brainstorm, people uh, wonder about governments uh, shutting down cryptocurrencies, stuff like that. Uh, for this talk, I'm not gonna be talking about legal action, not gonna be talking about violence. I'm just talking about disrupting a, a cryptocurrency by behaviors within the system. But there's still a lot of different ways to do that. So we can uh, kind of plot a spectrum from the most uh, disruptive ways to, to, uh, to attack um, down to maybe the, the least disruptive. Um, and so you'll think about a 51% attack causing a, a deep, arbitrarily long fork in the blockchain is uh, maybe the most disruptive thing that you could do. Um, down to maybe censoring blocks, preventing uh, service to individual parties is something that uh, is maybe the least disruptive because the system would still work well uh, for most people, but you could knock specific people off the network. And these different attacks map to different properties that uh, these systems are claimed to hold. So we want, uh, we want our consensus protocol to have eventual consistency. Usually we want it to remain live and we want it ideally to be fair to everybody who's trying to get service from the network. And I'll talk about a couple of different ways of trying to violate all of these, these properties. Okay, so we'll kind of start from the top and talk about different ways if you're trying to do, uh, again, what would be the most disruptive attack, attaining a majority, or of course I have an, uh, an asterisk here. You don't necessarily have to have 51% or 50% plus epsilon to cause a lot of disruption. Uh, it's not really specifically a, a magic number, depending on assumptions about the network and so forth. Uh, but it's a, it's a good rule of thumb. If you get a majority, you can certainly uh, really disrupt things. So there's a couple of different ways that you could endeavor to do this. Uh, and I've plotted them on two axes here. So the, the two axes are whether you're introducing new capacity to the system so in a proof-of-work based system, say if you're uh, bringing new capacity online that wasn't previously computing uh, proof-of-work for this system, um, or if you're uh, repurposing existing capacity, so sort of uh, buying out or taking over some, uh, some miners who are currently participating in the protocol. And the other axis is whether you're trying to permanently gain uh, control of that, uh, that mining capacity or just temporarily obtain control. So the four corners here, if you're trying to temporarily bring some new capacity online, I call that rental, whereas if you're trying to temporarily take over some existing capacity, uh, I'd call that bribery, and I'll walk through the different ways that uh, that, that can happen. Uh, whereas uh, in the, for the permanent attacks, if you're adding new capacity, that's building, building out new capacity, uh, and if you're permanently trying to take over existing capacity, I call that a buyout. And I'll talk a little bit more about that and its relationship to uh, buyouts in the, the more traditional sense of the term. Um, so just from kind of plotting different attack strategies and that, uh, that very simple uh, two-axis uh, classification, you can already see that some different consensus protocols aren't necessarily vulnerable to uh, all four of these types of attacks. So 
Uh, one big difference that jumps out right away, if you have a, a proof of work based uh, consensus protocol that is uh, highly dependent on ASICs, on specific mining hardware, you can make an assumption, and this may not, not always be true, but it's probably a, a, a good rule of thumb, that you won't be able to rent new capacity from outside the system. So for example, with Bitcoin, obviously the, the largest proof of work based system that we have, to a first approximation, all of the Bitcoin mining hardware that exists in the world is currently mining Bitcoin. Again, that's not exactly true. Some of it might be mining Bitcoin cash. Some of it might be out of service or recently retired. But most of it is mining Bitcoin. There's not a large marketplace for Bitcoin hardware that's just sitting around or doing some other activity right now. Whereas for a proof of work system that's designed to be uh, ASIC resistant, say that's primarily GPU mined, which is the case for Ethereum and a lot of other systems, there potentially is a large rental market uh, for, for GPU mining capacity, right? You can rent GPUs by the hour from Amazon and others. And there also happen to be a lot of different cryptocurrencies uh, that are GPU mined, so you can rent uh, from one system and use it to potentially attack another system. The, uh, the other big difference that jumps out, if you're talking about proof of stake compared to proof of work, there's no notion of adding new capacity to a proof of stake system. In a proof of stake system, the capacity are the coins within the system which is usually at least a fixed quantity, so it's not possible to just introduce a bunch of extra capacity from outside the system. If you want to attack, you have to obtain control of some of the existing capacity. So how much would it cost to rent enough power to attack Ethereum? And again, going with Ethereum rather than Bitcoin here, because rental attacks don't, uh, don't really make sense for Bitcoin. So these are the numbers that uh, I computed based on rental prices from Amazon. There's a couple of different places you could rent, including more specific uh, mining uh, hash power based marketplaces. Um, and you'll notice that there are very few significant figures on these uh, slides. That was uh, intentional. Uh, every time I talk about this or give some version of the talk, there will always be people tweeting at me claiming that I got a digit wrong. Uh, so I just want to stress, these are very approximate numbers. The point is really to look at orders of magnitude and get a sense of things um, and not give you an exact budget if you're in the back of the room thinking about uh, financing an attack like this. But basically, if you look at uh, the, the hash rate on the Ethereum network, what you can get on the GPUs that you can rent on Amazon, you end up somewhere in the range of a few million dollars an hour to rent enough capacity from Amazon uh, to potentially attack Ethereum. And there's a couple of caveats in order here. Uh, first of all, these aren't really the best GPUs to rent to attack. They're just what Amazon has. They're actually more optimized for uh, machine learning. Um, but you can use them to, to, uh, to mine on Ethereum. And the other caveat, um, it's not clear, Amazon doesn't make precise figures available, but if they have this much capacity to rent, it would be a very, very large fraction of the whole marketplace. So it's not completely clear that you could actually rent this much from Amazon, even if you were writing these checks. Um, but you could try, and probably in the future there will be large enough rental marketplaces that, that this kind of thing would be feasible. So the important thing uh, to take away really is that order of magnitude that for a few million dollars an hour you could rent enough capacity to be a majority miner on, uh, on the Ethereum network. And similarly for most other GPU mine currencies, in fact, probably a lower number for almost everything else. And this number is most interesting when you compare it to uh, the cost of building all that capacity from scratch. Again, this is a very approximate number. Um, but if you just looked at a uh, popular GPU that can be used to mine Ether, how much would it cost to buy enough of these units so that you would be the new uh, majority player on the network? You get a number that's somewhere in the billions of dollars range. So notice uh, you're basically off by a factor of 1,000 between building all this capacity from scratch or just renting it temporarily. Of course, uh, if you actually build it all, you now are the proud owner of all of these. So it's, it's obviously, a, you know, you're, you're getting something different for your money, 
Um, but it's interesting to look at the, the ratio of those two numbers. And of course, this is also ignoring a lot of factors. You have to buy, uh, you have to buy real estate and uh, build warehouses and cooling, and there's a lot of other admin overhead. This is a very, very approximate figure, of course, although you'd also probably get some discounts for buying in bulk. And you can, you can run through the same exercise for Bitcoin. Um, again, this is, uh, this is a commodity miner. You could probably do better if you were really trying to do this attack. But if you just push the numbers through in a fairly simple-minded way, you'll probably again end up somewhere in a few billion dollars to sort of rebuild enough capacity to be a majority miner on the Bitcoin network. So like I said, uh, the important thing to take away is really just what kind of difference you're looking at. And to ask yourself the question, in the case of Ethereum, uh, how do these numbers compare to the market cap? So if we think that Ethereum as a system is worth $20 billion, um, are we comfortable with that number of a few million dollars an hour to potentially rent uh, mining capacity and disrupt the system? And another thing that's interesting that I'll point out, uh, 20 billion is the market cap today. Within the past year, um, it's been over 80 billion, and the attack numbers basically didn't change. So to the extent that we want you know, it, uh, the price to be a certain amount for an attacker relative to how much the system is worth, it's interesting that those two numbers don't uh, necessarily always move in, uh, in sync with each other. The system can become a lot more valuable or less valuable overnight, depending on what, uh, how investors are feeling that day. But in the short term, at least, the cost for an attacker doesn't really change that much. So I also said uh, in passing that there might, be, uh, there might be a way to rent capacity in the case of uh, an ASIC mined cryptocurrency. Uh, this is actually, I think, a pretty interesting avenue that hasn't been explored that much. And I've talked to some people in the mining industry who've had different opinions on how feasible this would be. Um, but one place you could try to rent is by uh, paying people to turn on old mining capacity or, or paying people for the ability to use old mining capacity that isn't profitable to run anymore. So we've seen uh, pretty large, steady increases in how efficient mining hardware is. At a certain point, old mining hardware becomes uh, not profitable on the margin, so it can't even pay for uh, its own electricity to run. And at that point, it might be sent to salvage, but it might still be sticking around in case market conditions change. But if you're an attacker, you don't really care if it's running at a slight loss, if it's uh, extra capacity that you can acquire really cheaply. OK, so um, I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about uh, bribery. So how could you actually pay existing miners to do your attack for you? And this has been uh, kind of a fun very niche uh, part of the, the literature on, uh, on Bitcoin that's developed over the past couple of years. Um, so the most obvious way you could think of to do this is to just pay people outside the system. Um, and you can do this. So there are uh, mining marketplaces where you can, uh, you can pay existing miners for capacity. But I think there are more interesting ways to do this. Uh, then this is kind of the most simple-minded way to do it. Uh, so you could start your own mining pool, and you could actually pay a negative fee. So there's no fundamental reason why a 0% fee is the best you can do. If you're an attacker and you're willing to run a mining pool at a loss, just have it be a negative fee. You'll be the best deal in town from any miner who wants to join your pool. Use the existing pool mechanisms to actually pay off all the miners participating. They'll be happy, they'll be getting paid for their hashes, but of course, uh, all of the block templates that you're giving out will be for use in your attack. And you'll lose money doing this, um, but you don't care if you're, uh, if you're attacking the network. Some more interesting uh, and kind of devious ways to do this, you can actually pay miners uh, in band by putting a bunch of uh, transactions onto one fork of the network so notice uh, the, the sort of free money that you're putting out here is only valid 
on your fork of the blockchain that you're uh, trying to get miners to join. Um, and you would put this in the form, there's a couple of different ways to do this, but you would put this in the form of what are called anybody can spend transactions. Which means any miner who mines a block will be able to take that money for themselves. And you can use things like time locks to sort of spread this money out so uh, each of the next K blocks that are mined on your fork will get this big bonus. I noticed that uh, this way of paying or this way of, of bribing has some interesting properties uh, that may be good, may be bad. Specifically, uh, these rewards will only be valuable if your fork actually becomes canonical. So if you're trying to do this attack and it fails, all of the bribes that you've put out will become sort of worthless. The miners are, who would join your fork are absorbing all of that risk. Like I said, um, it's good if you're the attacker, perhaps, but for miners, maybe makes it a little bit less attractive to accept these bribes if they're only valid contingent on this attack succeeding. You could do a very similar thing. Instead of having anybody could spend transactions, you could just post some transactions that are only, uh, only valid in your attack fork that have really, really large fees. And this is potentially an interesting way to do it because we've actually seen some real transactions with suspiciously large fees. Or maybe I shouldn't say suspiciously, but unusually large fees. Uh, so this would be a way to, uh, to put, put bribes on your specific fork that would maybe look like background behavior. But I should say all of those ways of bribing are interesting, but I think by far the, the most interesting uh, and flexible way to do it is to use a smart contract. So this is a really neat idea in a paper that came out just this year, actually, with a proof of concept showing that you can have a smart contract on Ethereum that actually pays bribes to miners on the Bitcoin network uh, for finding blocks either on a specific fork or possibly blocks with specific properties, like empty blocks. Uh, and I'll get to why you'd want to do that in a second. Um, but the mechanics of this have all been worked out, and it's been shown to be possible. You can... The bribes, of course, will be uh, in Ether going to Bitcoin miners, but you know, potentially you could do this. You could actually do it uh, internally within uh, Ethereum for bribing uh, Ethereum miners, and you could basically go from uh, really from any system that supports smart contracts to any other system. So this is really nice because uh, you can basically set it up however you want. You can have the miners assume risk if the attack fails. You can have the briber assume the risk, and you can also uh, prove by putting all the bribe money on deposit that bribe money will be available into the future for sort of any length of time that you want. So really, really flexible, powerful way to, to do this. And we'll see it comes up in a couple of different attack scenarios, this ability to uh, not only bribe, but basically commit to your bribes in the future using a smart contract. So like I said, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to do this that have been developed in the literature now, and they have different properties in terms of where the risk is if the attack fails. Uh, but the smart contract-based way of doing it is kind of the most uh, flexible and powerful. So the question becomes, basically, how much do you have to bribe miners, or how much of a bribe would it take for miners to do your bidding? And a good rule of thumb, at least a lower bound, is that you'll have to pay uh, miners at least more than they're making by normal mining behavior. Um, and if you look at that for, uh, for Bitcoin, for Ethereum, it's in the range of a few hundred thousand dollars per hour and lower for most other systems. But this is already uh, sort of promising if you compare it to a rental attack. So remember, that was a few million dollars. For bribery, I'm saying you'll have to pay at least a few hundred thousand, but it might actually be cheaper than... Uh, rental, and you can think that that makes sense. You're basically bribing people who've already uh, worked out the details of having very efficient mining hardware rather than having to rent some perhaps not uh, completely fit for purpose hardware. And notice again, if you compare this to the total value of these systems, there's a really, really big gap here. Um, should it make you nervous? I don't know, but there is. Uh, you know, something like five orders of magnitude between, again, the lower bound on how much you would have to bribe and the, the total value of these systems. 
And then the question is, would miners actually take this bribe? And the initial reaction a lot of people uh, will respond with is, no, they shouldn't take bribes because this is risky for the system. Uh, it's bad for the ecosystem as a whole. It might hurt the exchange rate, which is really hurting the miners. Sometimes I've heard the phrase used, cutting off your nose to spite your face, or maybe just acting in very short-term interest at the expense of long-term interest. So it's kind of reassuring to think that way that uh, miners won't take these bribes, knowing that uh, participating in an attack will hurt the system in the long run. But I'm not sure that that's the entire picture. And the reason is that if uh, every miner thinks that way, then the attack won't succeed. But then if a couple of miners decide to take the bribes, they'll make more money and they don't have to worry since I just told you the attack's not going to succeed. But then if everybody thinks that way, everybody will take the bribes and the attack actually will succeed. So you're basically trusting all miners to do the right thing, uh, not accept extra revenue, extra uh, profit through, through taking bribes to protect the long-term health of the system. And it's very difficult to, uh, for miners to actually enforce that everybody behaves honestly. And there's a big uh, theory in literature about this in economics, but it can be classified as a tragedy of the commons where, uh, um, again, you, you wish that everybody had the discipline to not overuse this, uh, this resource and to maintain long-term health, but uh, it can be very difficult to enforce that that happens. Okay, so I want to talk about proof of stake a little bit and what an attack would look like. As I told you, you can't really, uh, you can't really build and you can't really rent. You have to use existing capacity. Probably all of the bribery attacks would carry over to proof of stake, but there's also some interesting uh, comments to have uh, to, to make about what it would look like to buy out capacity in a proof of stake system. So the interesting observation here is that saying that you're going to buy out a proof of stake system can actually impact markets. And there's precedent for this in the real world, of course. Uh, but let's just look at what this might look like in a proof of stake system. Specifically, there's the risk that if you tell people you're going to acquire a majority of the tokens in a proof of stake system with the express uh, goal of killing the system, of disrupting consensus and getting it to crash, that could start what's called a race to the door, where all of a sudden everybody wants to sell because they don't want to be left holding tokens in a worthless system. So you make a threat. If people actually believe your threat, that means the likelihood the system fails goes up a little bit, which means uh, the current stakeholders have more incentive to sell. And the more stakeholders that sell, failure grows a little bit more likely. And if you do this right, you can sort of get a vicious cycle to start where everybody wants to leave because the 49% of stakeholders who don't sell, if your attack is successful, will basically be left with nothing. Uh, and again, I said I'd mention smart contracts a lot. Um, you can do this whole thing in a smart contract. So if you're worried about how you make people really believe that you're going to buy the system out, well, you can actually, if the system's uh, small enough, if you have enough money, you can put on deposit in a smart contract all of the money that you need to buy out the system, and you can have the smart contract run an auction uh, for people who are willing to sell to you. And that's a very good way to make your buyout threat credible because people can observe the smart contract and see that you're serious and you've actually put the money uh, up and you're committed to this strategy of doing a buyout. Um, so I'll just talk about uh, a couple of other things that you could try to do to disrupt a, a system and point out that you don't necessarily uh, need to obtain a majority. You don't need to cause a deep fork to disrupt the system. For one thing, you might be able to cause a fork, at least in the short run, with less than 50% capacity. So if you try, you have some probability, you know, if you have something like 30 or 40% uh, of introducing some short forks. And even if you have a low percent, you can increase uh, block contention or the stale block rate, uh, no matter how much capacity you have. And there's some interesting attack scenarios here, which I think are, are pretty underexplored current, currently, where you just create, uh, with a little bit of impulse to the system, you can prevent consensus from being reached for a long time. Uh, so the way this might work, or at least a thought experiment, 
um, you know, what if you put one block into the system with a transaction fee that was worth many, many thousands of blocks worth of revenue? So we've actually seen that on the Bitcoin network and nothing uh, crazy actually did happen. But at least potentially, that could be a reason for lots of miners to fork and say, I would rather try to remine this block and hope I get lucky uh, rather than continue to, to mine for the low block rewards in the future. And in some models, just by producing one block with a large transaction fee, you can cause the network to not consolidate for a very, very long time. Maybe you don't want to mess with uh, consensus at all. You just want to uh, prevent the system from making any progress, from including any transactions. And there's a couple of different ways you could do that as well. So the simplest thing you could do is try to just flood the network with uh, more useless transactions with high transaction fees than there is actual demand for transactions. But the more clever thing you could do using a smart contract is you could actually pay miners for mining empty blocks with no transactions. So you could give miners a bribe contingent on them mining empty blocks. And of course, uh, to make this worth the miners uh, while, you'd want your bribe to be more than the revenue that they're currently making in transaction fees. And how much are miners making in transaction fees? Well, now it's even a much lower number than their total revenue. Uh, so it's on the order of a few thousand dollars an hour for Bitcoin and for Ethereum. There's a caveat here, of course, if you actually did this attack and nobody was able to get their transactions in, people would probably start offering higher and higher transaction fees. So the actual cost of this attack might be a bit higher, at least over time. But in the short run, potentially for a few thousand bucks an hour, you could prevent these systems from making progress. Uh, and finally, just to talk a little bit about censorship, um, what if you wanted to prevent some specific accounts uh, from, from moving their money, from having transactions included in blocks? So the simplest way to do this, again using a smart contract, is that you would pay uh, bribes to miners that would be small bonuses if they enforced your blacklist. So you would publish a list of addresses that you uh, would like to not, not be able to transact in the system. And as long as uh, miners respect that, they'll get bribes from your smart contract. And there's a lot of different ways you could potentially set that up, but that would be the basic idea. So that uh, seems like maybe a little bit tough to pull off if you're a sensor, if you're an attacker, because you have to provide bribes in every single block to prevent service. And all it takes is occasionally a block uh, to not violate your blacklist, to turn down, uh, to not honor your blacklist, to not take the bribes, uh, for your target to actually get their transactions included. So a much more devious and, and difficult uh, for, the, for the system way to do this uh, is an idea that uh, is actually quite old, goes back before the days of smart contracts. Um, which is to say that uh, rather than bribing miners for honoring your blacklist, you will punish miners if they violate your blacklist. And you would punish them uh, by potentially bribing other miners to try to, to, uh, to fork around their block, to ignore their block. So the way this attack would work, you would say, if anybody violates my blacklist, if they include a transaction from one of these uh, undesired addresses, I will spend a certain amount of money trying to, uh, to orphan your block, trying to fork around the block that you've just created. And you can commit to this whole thing in a smart contract. And the amazing thing about this attack is that it might actually end up costing you zero. And the reason is that if every miner thinks that they're going to be subject to this punishment if they violate the blacklist, well, maybe they'll all be scared and, and honor the blacklist. But if they do that, then you'll never actually have to pay to carry out your threats. So you'll just have some money on deposit in a smart contract, basically a war chest threatening miners uh, if they don't follow your blacklist. But if, you're, uh, if your deposit is large enough, you may never have to actually spend it. Um, so it's very, very uh, tricky and kind of underexplored. What are some countermeasures uh, against these sort of attacks? And I'll just point out that the, the real-world equivalents uh, that we know of basically all require uh, 
uh, things like uh, the law to prevent these sort of attacks. There's been an idea that miners shouldn't get their block rewards uh, right away. Um, that always comes up when I give these talks. So I just want to say uh, I don't think it's a very promising strat uh, countermeasure and the reason is that miners can offload this risk. So it's been kind of an exciting time. I, I first gave a version of this talk about uh, eight months ago or at least last March and then within a few months we actually saw some real evidence of this happening. Um, so we saw some uh, large 51% style attacks uh, against a bunch of smaller coins last spring. Um, and there's even an app you can go to that will give you real-time uh, real estimates of how much it looks like it will cost to do a rental attack based on current uh, mining rental prices. So I predicted before then and I continue to predict that we'll see more of this type of stuff in the future unfortunately as it gets easier to make money by disrupting a system uh, by taking a short position more systems sort of using the same uh, proof of work. And I guess I'd like to leave you with uh, one question. I showed you a bunch of different attack models and some rough, rough estimates of how much they cost. Um, there's some very troubling questions about how much these attacks should cost. We'd like them to cost a lot. We'd like uh, miners to be making a lot of money and be very happy so they don't want to accept bribes. But miners making a lot of money implies either high transaction fees or a lot of inflation. Um, so it's a difficult uh, situation, but I think it's an exciting time to see uh, where this goes, how many of these attacks we actually see uh, in practice. So I'll, uh, I'll keep watching this space. And please uh, come find me if uh, you have any questions, if you want to brainstorm. I, I love kind of thinking up new attacks in this vein. So thanks a lot.